Oh, dude, I'm gravy, man. Welcome back to another episode of Halal <laughs> Cartels. Here we go. Once again, it's your illustrious host, Gabe Pacheco. Uh, well, just one of your hosts, but... My and partner. you've got Samir Nassim. <laughs> That's right, man. Can you believe it? Yeah, we're both here uh, at the same time. Same place. Yep. And uh, we're really thrilled that you're tuning in today. We're, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm trying to read. I'm trying to read books. Yeah. <laughs> I had a plan at the beginning of the summer that I was going to read five books, and I have started five books. Yeah, I'm in the same exact boat, and I think... Uh, what makes it the worst is that I have the library app, so I have immediate access to any book that anyone's thrilled at, usually. Sometimes I have to put it on a wait list, but basically if you say, I love X book, I look it up right away, add it to my list, or immediately borrow it. Yeah, you don't even need Audible if you have the library app. It's right? true, for the most part. Uh, but the library app does put this like gun to your head. Yes. Because they, they turn over a digital hourglass that is fake that you really don't even need. But, you have to, but they're like, you still have to check in the books. Yeah. So it's like you can you can read this book for, or listen to it, I guess, for what? Uh, um, how, 21 how, days sometimes. 21 days later, that book just vanishes from your library. But 21 days vanishes really quickly, too. That's something that I've learned from the library app, you know, because I'll get the book. I'll start reading it. I'll be three chapters in. Then I'll get another book, and I'll be like, oh, I've got to begin this one and just see what this is all about. I've heard it's all the rage. And then I look back, and I'm like, what? I have five days left? Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting because uh, I, I bought the hard copy of uh, Chuck Klosterman's The 90s. Oh, yeah. But you've been apping it up. Yeah. You got it for free from the library. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I'm buying anything. I guess I'm a, I'm a little bit of a tactile hoarder. Mm -hmm. You know, I like the analog forms. Of I things. do too. Though it's a lot more versatile. It's not fun to read a book on an iPhone, to be honest. But when necessity kicks in, I'll do it any day. You know? Yeah, man. That's right. We're highly adaptable. Besides, we read so much. If you actually quantify it by what you're reading, uh, it doesn't matter if you, it's a book or if it's scrolling through feeds or if it's reading the news on your phone. Inevitably, you are reading a lot on your phone, so why not make it a cool book? You know, when you go to when you watch um, movies or talk to like in Hollywood industry people, they annoyingly use the first names of actors as though you're supposed to know who you're, who I you're talking so about. Much. They're like, you know, I was just in Tribeca at Bobby's Festival, and I'm like, kill yourself. Yeah, I'm like, you do not know Robert De Niro, <laughs> and stop calling him Bobby. That's so dumb. I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't stand it. <laughs> Like Steven Spielberg. Well, Steven's new movie. Yeah. We're not on a first name basis yeah. with Spielberg. We're all real. really thrilled with Steven's new ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Chuck, I'm Chuck. reading Mr. Klosterman's book. Right. <clears throat> Mr. Klosterman. <laughs> and we've, we've spoken before about uh, kind of half half acidly i think we we described the mandela effect on an on a prior episode and then chuck goes in uh mr clusterman goes through a whole um uh, part of the 90s book talking about the mandela effect yep and i thought that was so fascinating because when you couldn't just access information on your phone yeah. like right away and fact check people the most charismatic person in the room however confidently they described an event just became what that circle of friends believed happened right and then yeah. and then they would continue to spread that message uh through their circles of friends so that's like the most uh non um like supernatural way of describing the mandela effect like right. the least magical way is just like oh it's a game of telephone where information mutates over time yes uh in in a vacuum and everybody <laughs> actually believes they're friends right who are right. wrong consistently uh-huh they're like yeah mandela um died in prison it's like that's how that's what the mandela effect was where people thought mandela died in prison rather than being released and then becoming the president of south africa in post-apartheid times sure uh one thing i think is amazing is if it wasn't in the news cycle then you couldn't verify it so if somebody said something insane you just had to take their word for it. It wasn't like you were going to go pick up the New York Times and be like, oh, this is wrong. Right, exactly. <laughs> so the only way you could do it 
is to go to the library and look through microfiche because there was no internet back then. I 100% never used microfiche outside of the one day that we had a tutorial on it in yeah, school. Yeah. And I don't even think that my teacher uh, at that time knew that much about it because he just kind of half-heartedly alighted over the topic. Yeah. And I was like, when would I use... Dude, I'm not a true detective, uh, like, gory crime fan. The only time I've ever seen microfiche used is in movies where a, a woman uh, buys a haunted house right. and then has to go and do research to see why there's, like, a little wet ghost girl that keeps floating through the hallways. <laughs> it's an old <laughs> newspaper article yeah. about a death that happened at the house. Yeah. And they're like, oh, like, and then it's a dramatic music. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> the soggiest slaughter, <laughs> 1932. <laughs> <laughs> like oh slaughter at soggy mansion <laughs> yeah you're like, <laughs> you're like oh. oh that makes complete sense that's why there's like all these like little <laughs> fucking wet ghoul ghost girls barefoot dripping all over my hardwood floors i wonder if they still update microfiche if analogs keep it going <laughs> if they're like hey listen like uh i don't know how to use the internet but i do know how to use microfiche so also, I don't even remember how this worked, but how could you find what you were looking for? Did you have to sit there and go through a year's worth of New York Times until you found, oh, here's an article about uh, Mandela? Like how, you know, because back then they had encyclopedias that were updated maybe every couple of years. Maybe even the ones that were annually updated were stupid. Oh, you well. got the Encyclopedia Britannica exactly. and you would buy the box set. And then everything, they'd print thousands of copies of this, waste all of this money on producing it. And then the next year, all of that information would be irrelevant. Exactly. So like I had a globe uh, in the, I had a globe from the eighties Yes. and it was uh, like China was Taiwan. And then like the part that is China was not called China. Oh, well, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, U.S. foreign policy is a little, you know, it's not, uh, <laughs> it doesn't reflect reality when <laughs> we acknowledge this tiny ass little barren rock island filled with white army reactionaries as the true nation of China, as opposed to the landmass. <laughs> and, um, and then also the Soviet Union still existed on this map. Right. So, uh, the minute that the wall fell, we needed to reshape all of that. And then every couple years, different countries form and countries get different names. So, you know. Right. That, I mean, that was a very transitional time. That yeah. globe. Uh, yeah. That globe, <laughs> even in Africa and Eastern Europe, uh, it was just ever shifting every year. Uh, that's not what it's called now. Uh, that border changed, you know. There's even East and West Germany on those globes. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, the US CIA version of the globe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, uh, so you got to see, you got to know that like all of these hard copy things are fluid and they change. But think about how difficult uh, it would be to be an annoying Reddit man back then. Like you hang out with all your friends and they think Nelson Mandela is still in jail and you're, you're like, hmm, I don't know. And you got to go to the public library the next day or like schedule it out and yeah. go to the library. And then I'm going to debunk this. Yeah. My friend's onto something wrong here. Dig through the microfiche, then take your Polaroid camera and take photos of the microfiche. <laughs> <laughs> or like if you don't have a Polaroid, you're taking like regular film and then you got to go to to the 24 hour uh, film place and get your roles developed. Oh, yeah. And then show up at your next uh, hang with a dossier. <laughs> he's, he's wet. <laughs> you just got out of the lab. Here you go. I took photos myself. <laughs> I printed them out at home. Oh, man. But you know what? I don't know if today, if uh, so, yeah, we do have instant facts now mm -hmm. that yep. we can harvest from our phones. Yeah. But something that feels like they've just found new ways to lie to us or to make getting information harder. So now it's like the flood of, uh, of facts in air quotes that uh, I think like make our world equally as chaotic and confusing as it was pre-internet. hundred percent. I completely agree. The purpose of Google actually 
was to drive relevant and to be current, right? So when Google started, it was a reaction to broken links on the web uh, on search engines like Lycos, Alta Vista, et cetera. Uh, Google came in to solve that problem, right? And to continually spider and in, around and index the internet and show you the most relevant information. They really crash shaped what search engine optimization meant and have continued to do mm, so. Sounds like really efficient and really good. Yeah. Uh, almost utopian. What was the downfall of Google's algorithm? Revenue all day. So everything is about money and money talks. And so if you want to find out what people think of a certain thing, you're going to have a sanitized version of that based on whose interests are at stake. So if you want to find out why a certain mattress company sucks, well, they're going to be there counterbidding that and they're going to be presenting you with information about, well, actually, this mattress company doesn't suck and they're behind it, right? But that scales up to everything, including politics. It's just, what does Google want you to think about a specific thing? So like they if, control, control that info. Right. So like let's say if I go to uh, like mattress discounters and I'm looking for like the best mattress to have group sex on. <laughs> okay. And then I go there and I meet like a very nice salesperson and, and I'm like, can I try out this mattress? Can I try out that, that mattress? And I try out a couple, but, you know, they have limited inventory. And then that salesperson goes, you know what? The model that's really best for what you want, for the for the steady pumping group sex that you want, we don't actually have it in stock here, but uh, you should order it from me. Trust me. Then I order it. I get it back to my place. I got the tarp down. I got, <laughs> I got, tarp. I got Gatorade for everybody. <laughs> There's snacks. And then, uh, lo and behold, it's... Not it's it's can't handle what we're doing. This mattress is subpar. And then I write some reviews about how terrible that mattress is. Right. And I put it on my blog and my I've got the most truthful take. I've got Polaroids to yeah. prove that it didn't work the way that I wanted it to. I've got a dossier <laughs> on why this file. <laughs> why this mattress sucks. And I put it up there and it should be top algorithm yeah and what and like what you're telling me though is that the sponsored content will be the first 20 hits so and my, then it'll my be truth a, will be buried 100 percent. but it'll also be other companies that are paid behind the scenes by that mattress company to prop them up through editorial and then their way connected uh and they have uh you know tons of cross-linking and stuff so they rank higher so it's like the first 15 things are all ads it's like the actual mattress that you talk shit on, their ad is going to be at the top. And then a competitor being like tricking you into clicking their thing by using the name of that mattress. But when you click it, you're like, wait a minute, this isn't that mattress. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you are, well, what the hell is this? Anyways, that's what they hope. But yeah, exactly what you said. Everything is just about money now. And so there's a lack of relevance. And a lack of a good experience as well. And then it comes down to what Google's interests are, too. I mean, as a big company, um, what are we trying to do? What's the agenda we're trying to get across? Not to be an Alec Jones or something, but let's be real. Why not? Let's talk about the, <laughs> let's talk about the Google algorithm goblins. They've got an algorithm factory, and they've got all these little pointy-hatted goblins just hanging out. <laughs> probably in, probably in a US territory where you don't have the same jurisdiction of US constitutional laws but you do have the military. I think the I think the goblin factories in Guam. The best part about all of this <laughs> is that even though you're kidding, probably 80% <laughs> of it is right. <laughs> we've we've set up a nice cushy little base for all of the credit card companies and <laughs> algorithm sock puppet bots. Google just paid Israel over a billion dollars for um, spy software slash AI based surveillance stuff. Yeah. Why? <laughs> you know, why? <laughs> why though? Why though? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess the point of this is that I know that if, if I search something on Google, uh, it feels like I am inundated with snake oil, uh, like con artist websites yes. that are all sponsored before I can get to any official 
uh, information. Wait, so one other thing. If you type in, did Nelson Mandela die in jail on Google, did you notice that it'll the first seemingly relevant article that pops up, you'll click on it, and when you go to it, <laughs> you have to read... Like two pages of expository bullshit. <laughs> Before, they go like, so did Nelson Mandela die in jail, or did he was he freed and did he become a president of the country? What we need to do is look back at the concept of not. And you're like, Yo, what is this? <laughs> it's very to bring back Bill Clinton. Define die. Yeah, <laughs> define, De- define die. Nelson. Define Mandela. Exactly, and. It's because the other trick is the more time you spend on that site, technically the more relevant it becomes to what you typed in in the search. So, and so that's like wants you to waste forever looking for an answer before you exit. Otherwise, their relevance will go. Their bounce rate will depend on how high they rank. So if you go in there and spend a minute digging around, you're like, oh, now I'm finally here. Like, did he fucking die or what? And then it, you, by the time you were like, oh, he didn't, he was the president. Why did it just say that at the top? Ah, and then you get out of there, but it just records it as, oh, this person spent longer than usual on this site. This is relevant. Yeah. This must be the type of site that he wants. Let's make sure that we send him more (laughs) sites like this. Yeah. And then the AI takes over and it's like, all right, just show them all snake oil people (laughs) stuff that takes forever to get to the point. Like the same thing exists with recipes, right? Like best heirloom carrots recipe and then you get there and i'll be like my mother and grandmother even loved the taste of carrots it's just three paragraphs of nonsense about ate so many carrots that the skin under our fingernails turned orange (laughs) and then you're like okay here we are the carrot recipe and then it's flanked by all ads that keep refreshing <laughs> and moving the page up and down so you have to find your place again. And you, if you're searching on a phone, you're always clicking on these ads by accident. They're mm-hmm. all just like landmines that freeze your phone up. Literally. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. Not only did I not get the recipe, but I had to cancel out of every application on my phone because I got a weird virus now. Dude, I love it. The free market's dope. It's, it is it right? really it that that how it uh, coincides with technology mm, chef's kiss and how efficient. it just sabotages everything good <laughs> i love how no one can be good if money is involved it, it, the whole point of google was let's not be evil and then they were like you know what let's be fucking evil <laughs> so after they changed to what do they called now like alpha or whatever sure alphabet alphabet yeah um, anyway, that's something I thought about with the, this nineties book. Another, uh, something else that came up was this, uh, uh, landlines. Oh yeah. So I thought about how now we're just constantly talking mobily, but back in the day you were tethered like a dog, like staked, uh, chained and staked to like a geographic location where you could go and check your answering machine. Right. So if you, if you were out of pocket for a couple of days, it was exciting to come back and like check your messages. Oh yeah. And uh, who was it? Who called? There's yeah. 13. Uh it's this is the doctor's office. It was just everyone too. It was it was different facets of your life. The dentist, uh somebody trying to sell you some dog shit. Yeah, um, old friends, a family member. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it wasn't just for you, but it was for if you lived in a house, you had to scream, you listen to everybody's voicemails right. who lived in that house. Right. <laughs> so you knew everybody's business or who was trying to get in touch with your dad, your mom, your brothers, your sisters. Yep. Right. Or if you had uh, roommates or if you had uh, like other people living in the house, but you only had one line. Yeah. Like you knew everybody's business based on who was trying to get in touch with them. And then for like, Several years, I was against voicemails. Right. Like, I thought only uh, the boomers in my life were sending me voicemails, and it was always tedious. Like, I don't need a two-minute-long message when you can just text me so I can read it. Right. Um, Or just the idea, because I was always in transit, always moving around the city, so it's like, I don't have time. Or uh, services spotty, if I'm underground, I can't read this. I can't listen to this. Right. But I could read it. But now I've come, like, I've done a 180 where I've seen the light, everybody. I love voice messages now. 
not when you need to send me like a time and a place to meet, but ju- I just want to hear people's voices. That's so interesting because this is something that's coming around in my life too. I would never listen to the voice messages people sent me, but even the text, the ones that come in text, I mean, yeah, um, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. So I would never listen to those because somebody would leave me like a one minute and 13 second one. And like you said, I'd be all going all over the city. So I wouldn't have time to take my phone, put it to my ear, listen to it. If I had headphones, it's more likely, but yeah, I'd just save it. And then they would miss, they would need something. And so they would text me after that. And those voice notes would just get buried. Yeah. Uh, but now I listen to them and respond to them, and I think they're way better. Also, the passive aggressive nature of text, where you don't know if someone's pissed at you, you don't know the wrote, tone. Okay, yeah. So you're like, okay, meet you at three p.m., and they just write okay in caps lock, and you're like, whoa, yeah. What happened between us? I didn't know we were like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, because like I remember dating uh, some I uh, uh, <laughs> my my old girlfriend. She got so freaked out if I put a period in a text, and for me, it was just good grammar, right? But for her, she's like, "Yo, that felt so dramatic." <laughs> and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" And and then and also with like work emails, just like the way that uh, punctuation has changed. With work emails at all the nonprofits I'm at, if I don't put an exclamation point after like agreeing to something, it almost feels like uh, violence. Right. Like I gotta write like "thrilled to be there!" exclamation point. Yeah, or 100%. like this is gonna be awesome! exclamation point. This is why the exclamation <laughs> point has come back in a big way. When you're a kid, you rarely use that shit. Yeah, but now. Uh, now because we have to like love being slaves at our jobs, yeah. we all, we have to put exclamation points in everything. Show boss, I'd love to. Yeah, because instead <laughs> of just <laughs> right, oh, oh my god, we're staying late today. Can't wait. <laughs> 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 what project creep? Cool, this wasn't in the contract. Can't. Sure, you got it on a Sunday. <laughs> You're talking about my current life. <laughs> mm, yeah, let's get that quarterly report bumping, son. It's- this is literally what's happening to me right now. Yeah, I just got a project foisted on my head, and I was, I said, "Hey, just a reminder, I have two kids." Yeah, and uh, so I'm not available in the evening, so I have to take care of them and put them to sleep. Exclamation point! <laughs> and they're like, "Of course, of course." And then this entire last week, I was working up to the hour of like 9 p.m. And constantly trying to be like, remember what we discussed? LOL. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No presh. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Hey, everybody. Just reminding you, we've got an all hands on deck Zoom call at (laughs) 830 a.m. Tomorrow. It's Monday. (laughs) I'll be there. It's lit, fam. Can't wait. Can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Three exclamation points. Because if you just write K or like you got, I'm there. They're not a team player. Yeah. I think something's wrong with them. Everybody else was excited. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so it is uh, a it's a race to the bottom with our toxic positivity. Honestly, LinkedIn is a new disaster. Like everybody on LinkedIn has spawned off this culture of self-important writing mm-hmm. where it's either humble brags or it's writing for just the sake of of a weird clapter and adulation that comes from just drones and zombies. I can't stand it. There's a Reddit thread called LinkedIn Lunatics. There's some really, <laughs> <laughs> really great stuff in there. And they're just unbelievable examples of people being so stupid and daft uh, and having to write something for the sake of writing it. But the new thing that really amazes me on LinkedIn is everyone talking about their mental health and how mentally ill they are or doing the candid uh, dry snitch about themselves where – they talk about crying in the bathroom at work or something. I'm like, yeah, your coworkers are reading this. <laughs> Today I cried in the bathroom. It was one of many times I did. The, what? Yeah. The uh, I, I believe it was the uh, 47th exclamation point in an email I'd sent that day that was the straw that broke this uh, weeping camel's back. 
I went into the bathroom with two humps full of tears, <laughs> and I came out completely <laughs> deflated, humpless. Humpless. <laughs> yeah. Had to go back to the water cooler and replenish. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was so dehydrated. Tears were no longer coming out. I had to replenish so I could cry more. Yeah, weeping dry. <laughs> Hashtag. The best thing is when I work with people from other countries on a global project, and they're they're like, what is going on in America? We have people in Europe and England and stuff have insane uh, workers' rights compared to us. Dude, my okay. So I have a friend whose uh, wife is like very, um, I guess, famous in Amster in like Holland, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, Belgium as a uh, touring uh, or actor, actress, actor. So she's um, a headliner, and uh, they went on vacation together, and I think it was like in August a couple years ago, and her manager kept trying to call her. And he sees that her phone is blowing up with like a manager calling. And he's like, why aren't you picking this up? And she's like, because it's vacation. Like, why would I do that? Right. And the guys definitely got gigs lined up and things to talk about. But even the artists there are not like uh, dying to hustle in this race to the bottom to make everyone's life worse. Yep. <laughs> it's like, Which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Because th that's a firm line in the sand there. Yeah. Where vacation is vacation. You're doing it so that you don't work. And so you don't think about work. You don't get hounded by work. There are places where it's go it's going to be illegal to contact someone outside of their working hours. I love or that. Or a finable offense or something. That's I great. I don't think they like block you in jail, but. No, I love yeah. that. I want, that's the only time I want cops to show up and like tase a bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if your boss calls you off work hours. Yeah. Um, there should, th th yeah. They should be able to geolocate where that call is coming from <laughs> and, and just send one of those little robot dogs <laughs> <laughs> to just. It just shoots a. Is that the guy? Yeah, just fry that dude. Yeah. Yeah, it don't kill him, but like definitely, but videotape him. <laughs> it's like ding dong. Yeah. Open the door. <laughs> it's a robot dog. It just hits you with the taser. Yeah, dude. And, but the, it's also blasting the song Special Delivery. So it's like <laughs> all the neighbors hear that and they're like, oh, this is popping. Like, what's going on out there? So they look out the window and they see this dude twi like, twitching, twitching out, twitching in his doorway. Yeah. And it's fuck around and find out, says the dog <laughs> as it trots off. It's, all of a sudden you get an Amazon package <laughs> and it's, you open it. It's that robot dog. Yeah. Amazon would never lend themselves to that effort, though. Amazon's all about after hours work. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, are you kidding me? Tase him? No. <laughs> Give him a gift. Yeah. He's harassing workers after hours. Yeah. Ooh, give him a gold star. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Oh, speaking of Amazon, before we go on to the next thing here. Yeah. Um. So the Lord of the Rings thing came out on Friday. For those of the, uh, you who are keeping track from home, that's a billion dollar series. The biggest budget for a TV series ever. A lot at stake for Amazon. I mean, in my opinion, not really, because look at how massive of a company they are. But they're hinging this on their future streaming sort of strategy and what they're going to do anyways. So they've really wanted people to watch this show. They spent so much of their in inventory and advertising on driving awareness of it and getting people to talk about it. It launched on Friday immediately gets trolled and <laughs> review bombed. <laughs> review bombed so badly that Amazon stopped enabling people to review it <laughs> because they're just getting bombarded. <laughs> I just pictured Jeff Bezos lifting weights in his home gym or whatever and having a fucking nuclear meltdown, watching all the reviews come in one after the other. Like, this show is garbage. This show is dog shit. Um, and honestly, I tried to watch it to see what it was all about. And it was like a half hour of exposition right before you even get it to the anything. And I just didn't like it at all. And I realized I was drifting and not really giving a shit because I was like, this, this was already a movie series that Peter Jackson made and the extended versions amount to like 
a full day's worth of content. It's like so 24 hours of movies. Is it just a regurgitation of the same story? Like, yes. are we getting Bilbo Baggins yet again? Well, so I, they start off with some like weird elf lady and it's like, before Middle Earth gets conquered or something. Mm -hmm. But my assumption is, yeah, I mean, they have to because uh, Bilbo was the central figure, right? Or uh, Frodo or whatever it is. Bilbo is a hobbit. But yeah, like Frodo. Yeah. So, I mean, what the fuck? I, I, th this is what I'm trying to say. With a billion dollars, you make a story that's already been told a few times? Yeah. Come on. That's where we're at. We love it. <laughs> yeah. We can't get enough. Reboot, baby. <laughs> I just, if you took a handful of bad decisions in their budgets and allocated it to something good, like feeding hungry people or resolving some type of climate change issue. Or just ar arming indigenous people in the rainforest with <laughs> weapons to, to kill loggers. Come on. <laughs> That'd be insane. We'd all have a better world. Uh, you know, Here's a tank. <laughs> <laughs> do what you got to do. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, because climate change is what's going to get us all. And, uh, you know, last episode we talked about uh, this great book I was reading, Ministry of the Future. Yeah. And in the book, uh, which is based in the very near future, there's a mass uh, mass death event, uh, a mega death event with uh, 20 million people in uh, India dying because of a heat wave. And the heat wave... And and because like there are certain cities in this book where the temperature hits that window where it's no longer uh, habitable by people, and so for like, I think it's like a week in the book, there is a power outage during a heat wave, and so it's so long that twenty million people die, and then after that, you know the world has to well most of the world ignores it, but some more radical elements like kind of form after this including a terror a terror organization called the children of kali which is dope but um we're seeing that exact thing happening in reality a week after we talked about this with pakistan yeah because like there is a massive flood <clears throat> in pakistan and when i think about floods you know i don't i didn't know the magnitude of it but they're saying that uh a, a thousand people died, which seems like a small number. Right. But then when you think that 33 million people are internally displaced in the country, that is a, uh, a harbinger of a mega death event. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when partition happened, millions of people died. And this isn't partition, but m that many people being displaced and not having resources and not having the things that they the meager living they already once lived has been stripped from them. I mean, the fallout from this is going to be significant and staggering for sure. Yeah, dude. 33 million people, dude. That's so crazy. It's such a massive <laughs> sum of people. That's like if this whole city was displaced four times. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, in there that when a flood happens, it is so uh, a gross. It's super gross because it's not like clean water everywhere yeah you know uh, when new york city got flooded uh, there was a, a fun house almost a year ago to this day yeah. where there was a torrential downpour and um they're just like dead rats like in the floating on the rivers that were the city streets but um you get all of the oil you get all of the toxic waste you get all of the sewage, uh, sewage that just like bubbles and erupts out of the ground and then coats everything. The entire landscape is going to be toxic after this, especially in any of the urban areas that were that had people in them. Yeah, and it's Pakistan. It's not the cleanest place on earth, and sewage is an issue. And um, people think floods are only, one, near places with rivers or what have you, but flash flooding is crazy. It can happen anywhere, right? Because... There's just nowhere for the water to go, so it just starts getting haywire. <laughs> yeah. But I saw a video of the Pakistan flood, and it did not look like anything I could even think of when I think of flood. It was raging, insane water, uh, just ripping entire buildings out of the ground and just sending them down this raging river that yeah, I, I'd say I cannot even explain it. Yes, uh, this I is mean, bigger than the tsunami. That hit uh, Thailand. Uh, this is bigger than uh, any. I mean, 33 million people is it's wild. 
Yeah, that's the other thing. Like tsunami. When I was a kid, I thought it was one big wave, like yeah. a rogue wave. And I was like, I mean, it could wreak havoc, right? There was that thought of a huge wave coming out of building in Japan. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, but it was a like cartoonish massive wave that's just gonna sure. take down a huge building. You're like but- maybe maybe a boaty can uh, surf on it in point <laughs> in, in point break. Point it's, break. It's the bells the 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 once every fifty years hundred foot wave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it's actually not right. I, I guess it's just a series of shit tons of waves that are just pulverizing everything and f- just taking over anything in their path. And there's a movie, it's called um, The Impossible. And it's with Naomi Watts and uh, Ewan McGregor. Yes. And it was about the tsunami in 2004. The uh, yeah. Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh-huh. And you watch it, and it's just start from finish. The tsunami, the beginning of the movie is the tsunami destroying everything in Thailand. And just then it carries you through this one family's journey of what happens to them. You know, they all wind up in it. Yeah. And they're just floating around in this horrible tsunami. <laughs> sure. And, uh, yeah, I just was shocked by it. My misconceptions of what a tsunami looked like and or what a flood looked like. This shit is very frightening. Yeah, yeah. And it, I guess it's just, um, you know, it's like the grossest version of Waterworld you could be in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right, because the water is is uh, is so disgusting. Oh yeah. You know, it's and, insane. And and the and it's that not necessarily that a bunch of people are dying have died yet, uh, relative to how many will perish from the um, from the pollution yeah. and the disease and just like not having uh, whatever they need, like all the creature comforts that you need to survive. Right. Moving forward. And like you said, right, now they're in a heat index, too, that's out of control. There's no power. There's no way for them to cool down. And they're in a soup of just shit and disease. Right. Oh, yeah. It's like one of the cities that's underwater right now in Pakistan is a city that has that hit that heat index from uh, Ministry of the Future. Exactly. So it's like wet and baking. (laughs) It's so horrible. Google uh, 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 charities for Pakistan, but don't fall for any of the first 20 because oh, yeah. those are all uh, sponsored content. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, this uh, 1% of proceeds is going to Pakistan. The rest is going to an already wealthy family. Yeah, anyway, well, what you said is correct. You got to always look at the charities you're donating to and make sure that the money is making it to the people it should because... Uh, live aid and and money like that i think was misappropriated uh whatever uh charities bono was involved with were straight up just funding his highfalutin lifestyle and paying for his private jet trips all over the world wow yeah yeah you know and and i'm gonna say that there's a little bit a little bit maybe of racism and that he hasn't been um uh uh blacklisted for this because uh you got why why clef Yep. Trying to help out Haiti, and he gets uh, he gets in trouble for misappropriation and lambasted for it. And uh, Bono's not. Oh hell no! But he also was the reason why uh, Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner got back together. He and um, Bob Geldof were on a boat uh, hired by Kushner, I guess, and um, to be marriage counselors to sing like, a private song for. Ivanka, they were all hanging out and they played a song for Ivanka or something to get them back together. I was just I love reading that. it. I, I just the guy I, I hate him more and more every uh-huh. year. The <laughs> more I find out about him, I'm like, what? You fucking piece of shit. And there's also a video of him complaining because he thinks someone's waving an IRA flag at his show, but it's actually just some other basic like flag and sloganry has nothing to do with the ira and he's like talking about how uh, the ira are fucked up and stuff really he wasn't an ira fan no he's like they killed lots of people and it's like yeah they were um definitely a reaction to lots of people getting killed yeah i I, I wonder what the origins of the ira were Hmm. (laughs) i I wonder what required them to come into existence exactly yeah, uh, nothing but the the positive treatment and benevolence of the British Crown. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, the benevolence. <laughs> I am not watching too much stuff right now. Oh yeah, yeah. Opting to read more. Yeah, I'm trying, dude. I'm trying to stay literate. Yeah, doing more comedy. Yes. Uh, right. We well, we both did thirty minutes. Uh, last Funhouse. That's right. We got time. We can feature for you. Oh, we can 100%. headline. Whatever we can headline. You need. We both have hours. For we sure. both we both have thick, juicy hours, my friends. Comfortably. <laughs> And yeah. it's not it's not a half hour of a Q and A session. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every comedian. So, what do you do for work, my man? I uh, like yo. How many of those shows end in people just not wanting to participate or saying the wrong thing that just doesn't make it funny? Oh, actually, I'm a teacher. All right. Well, fuck. I was hoping there's so said- many finance people that come to shows, and then the only response to that is like, "Kill yourself." Yeah. <laughs> so. What else? <laughs> oh, well, actually, I'm watching a show on HBO uh, called The Industry. You got to check it out. It's yeah. It's fucking great. You'll know this character, but um, remember in The Sopranos when Junior is in the mental institution and there's an Asian guy he befriends who acts out? Yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, he is one of the main characters of the show. So can we talk? I love that episode of The Sopranos. Yeah. Uh, junior s- scamming within the confines of a of an old like hospital because I uh, love like little scams. Yeah. Uh, and scams and flams. Scams and flams. <laughs> Flim flam man. <clears throat> so like here's like it's not really a scam, but I went to Costa Rica and uh, this was like ten years ago, maybe maybe longer. I went about twelve years ago and I did comedy across uh, the the whole country. But uh, on my way back. Uh, my friend was like, dude, buy four, at l- as many cartons of cigarettes as you can. And I bought four cartons of cigarettes. And in New York, the price had just gone up to like $12 or something. So I brought back these cartons and just put them in my book bag. And after doing shows in the East Village, I would go to the karaoke spots. And I would stand in front of the karaoke spots and sell uh, packs of cigarettes for like seven or eight bucks a pack. Because it was still more than uh, or less than what you would have to pay at the store, right? And uh, I and people, drunk people coming out of these bars at like eleven p.m., twelve p.m. were like happy to buy these. So I recouped uh, basically my plane ticket to Costa Rica, um, selling bootleg uh, cigarettes from their country. Oh my god, that's and amazing. And I, I'm, you know, it's not something I could have kept doing because, like, I would have been competing with the Chinese mafia that was down there. Because there's, like, you remember those old Chinese ladies would come around with uh, glowing yo-yos. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and then have, like, packs of cigs on them, packs too. of cigarettes and, like, flowers for, for dates. Yes. And so, yeah, like, I was definitely encroaching on someone else's territory. And I would have been, like, killed by the tongs if, <laughs> if, eventually. But... But for like you a get quick... too big as a cigarette bootlegger. <laughs> <laughs> but as like, a quick wow, in and this out. story took a left turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You take in enough of the money, you go Breaking Bad on that ass. <laughs> <laughs> you start growing your own fields of tobacco. I start wearing a fedora, and I'm like, I'm I'm in the Empire Building uh, business. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I was happy to just be level one corner boy. I didn't need to. Like, keep the game going and level up until right. I was a mogul. Yeah. You have just trucks full of cigarettes pulling in. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, like, one of those, like, little <clears throat> uh, hacks. Another one is uh, if you uh, always uh, give people gift cards for their birthdays or whatever, but then take down the number of the card and then uh, put put uh, put it in your calendar to uh, check the balance, like, a year later. And then um, if... If it still has a balance, just buy stuff using that gift card. Because at that point, whoever you gave it to has forgotten about it or lost it. That's so fucking genius. Yeah. They're like, why did someone scratch the foil haphazardly on this card? (laughs) (laughs) I assure you, it's unused. That's right. (laughs) But for now, (laughs) that's genius, dude. You know that American Spirit back in 2002, I'd say? They were giving out cartons of cigarettes. You just had to pay a sales tax and $1. Wow. That's yeah. how they hook you. That's how they that, hook you. That's and giving, they wanted uh, people to switch, you know? Yeah. And so who did they target? College kids. And what did college kids do? Oh, well, they don't sell cigarettes on our campus at UMass Amherst. So I'm going to buy these for a dollar plus tax. 
And then when people are desperate for cigarettes, I'm just going to sell them each of these packs, even though you're obviously not supposed to. They were like, smoke them all. Then this carton. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but people were just treating it like the new uh, B- BMG Music Club or whatever that shit was. Yeah. Like just scamming them nonstop. And um, yeah, they would give out cigarettes and cigarette paraphernalia at bars. This shit was awesome. And people were all scamming it and selling it. Flipping those cigs. That's right. Yeah. Prison currency. Oh, yeah. So let's get back to the industry. Oh, yeah, the industry. So the industry, it's that guy from the episode of The Sopranos, right? Like, he's a very memorable character because he overacts almost in that episode really <laughs> insanely. But um, he is the one of the main characters. It's a bunch of, uh, you know, graduates from college that are just entering the financial industry Specifically at a super reputable, that word I use very loosely, um, investment bank. And it's their journey of trying to... So the first season is them trying to prove themselves because they'll be let go after this like initial hazing period or whatever it is if they don't develop something or bring in business or prove their worth, right? Right. So this is the Hunger Games... In uh, as the TV show for like young finance bros. Yes, Hunger Games meets Euphoria, because it's the way they do this is you'll get bored really fast if you're listening to people talk about some shit you don't know. Specifically, foreign exchange, you know, um, currency rates (laughs) and currency rates. Yeah, so it'll just be a scene of them trying to convince some prospective client about a currency uh, trade. And then all of a sudden, I'll just fast forward to them fucking somebody or doing drugs yeah, or partying. And uh, that's all the show really is. But within that, there's so much amazing character development. Uh, you, yeah, I mean, it's the horniest show I've probably seen in a long time. Uh, but also just plays this role in showing you how ruthless that industry is and how, of course, if it's comprised of these people, then... Of course, the industry is corrupt, and subsequently, the whole system we abide by, capitalism, is going to be completely rigged and scammed up. (laughs) Well, I feel like this could... um, uh, One mistake, I think, is uh, people watch The Wolf of Wall Street, and they go, hell yeah, I want to be like that guy. Yeah. Like, they forget to watch the third act. Uh, Same thing with Scarface. Yes. People are like, hell yeah, I want to, like, become the coke uh, lord. Yeah. they they miss the the message at the end where you get <laughs> uh, shotgunned in the back and you fall uh you know off your balcony into the into the fountain right uh, so when we watch the industry are you do you think uh, people will watch this and be like dude I cannot wait to go into finance so I can do poppers and have sex in the Xerox copy room right and then and then uh whatever be cutthroat yeah and that's what people think. And that's what people do. But at the end of the day, it's just soul sucking. There's no um, redeeming. No, yeah, there's no redeeming value out of it. It becomes a game of do you worship money? Yes. Is money the only thing to you? Because you have to do so many unethical and shitty things when you work in that field. And it has to become me centric. Like, what am I getting out of this? And that's all that matters. So high recommend. I absolutely do. Yeah, I binge the shit out of it. The funny thing is I watched the first episode a couple of years ago when the pandemic began. Yeah. And I was like, this show seems like it could be cool. I don't know. And I didn't wait for the next episode to come out and I lost track. And then recently I went back to watch it and I just couldn't let it go. And I just over two days binged the first season and I'm on the second season right now. So yeah, it's exciting. Nice. Well, uh, I think we've done it for today. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Halal Cartels. And uh, we love all of the texts. I love all the texts I've been getting from listeners. And uh, the best thing you can do to show your love is if you are listening to an episode on your phone, take a screenshot of the episode and tag Samir Mon and Gabe Pack one and then post it and we will repost you listening to us on our feeds Also, leave us a review uh, in uh, Apple Music or iTunes or whatever you call it, Apple Pod. Leave us a review because that's the best place to bump us up in the algorithm. And uh, we have a Patreon. 
And we also have a weekly live show, Funhouse Comedy. Yeah, Wednesdays, 10 p.m. at Pete's Candy Store, 709 Lorimer Street, Brooklyn, New York. Come on through. Love to see you. Yeah, that's right. They got good spicy margs there. If you like a spicy marg. Yeah, and there's some halal heads that come um, every week. We see some new halal heads enter the show, and I love to see and meet people in real life. Yeah, and now leading us out of this episode, the spicy uh, soundtrack gifted to us by the one and only Serene Patel, a.k.a. Brown Privilege. Let's go. Let's go.